Hello class, this is Dr. Branch. I trust you're doing well. I'm going to address a few of the central ideas in Poverty and Wealth, Chapter 1, the 12 Key Elements of Economics. And on the next slide, I have a very disturbing picture from a, a famine in Sudan. And I have this picture for a reason. I want us to think very carefully about the ideas we're discussing here and thinking about here in relation to economics. And here it is. Kevin Carter won the Pulitzer Prize for taking this photo of a starving girl in South Sudan being stalked by a vulture. This tragic and terrible scene as this little girl is, is dying and a vulture right behind, behind her, a bird of carrion ready to devour her. I want us to look at this picture for a moment and realize when we talk about economics, we are talking about very serious issues. How do we help little girls like this that this may not happen, that such a tragic scene may not occur? That's what we're dealing with. And so the ideas that we're discussing and debating, advocating, rejecting, all have an influence on the way we answer problems just like this. So I want us to remember these are very serious issues. So let me just say a few things. First of all, opportunity cost is a central idea in this class. It comes out of this book. An opportunity cost is defined as the value of a foregone activity or alternative when another item or activity is chosen. So if you spend $5 at Starbucks today, that means you don't have that $5 to buy lunch at Burger King tomorrow. That's an opportunity cost. If you spend your time over the summer uh, going rafting and climbing mountains and doing all those things, that means you're, you're not taking a class which might help you graduate more quickly. So those are all opportunity costs. So let me just say a few other things. Let's talk about incentives matter. First of all, an incentive is a cost or benefit that motivates a decision or action by consumers, businesses, or other participants in the economy. And this really leads to the basic postulate of economics, which will be on your midterm. All economics rest on one simple principle. Changes in incentives influence human behavior in predictable ways. Now what they mean by that is that as costs go up, typically demand goes down unless the item is so desirable that people are willing to pay more for the item. Now I, I don't know the degree to which we can predict human behavior. Humans are infinitely complex and, and people have uh, failed many times trying to predict human behavior. But the basic idea, the basic postulate is that as prices go up, demand goes down. So the law of demand, when prices go up, quantity of demand goes down. When prices go down, quantity of demand increases. And here it is again. If the benefits derived from an option increase, people will be more likely to choose it. Conversely, if the personal cost of an option increase, people will be less likely to choose it. There's always risk involved in every decision that we make. And so people are weighing the cost when they, they make these decisions. So. If the price is too low, consumers want to purchase more of an item than producers are willing or able to sell. That's assuming the item is desirable. I don't know how many people are really looking to buy a, a 1980 version of an eight-track cassette tape, uh, player. But it, the price, as the price increases, sellers will be more willing to provide the item while buyers purchase fewer. To the higher price brings the amount demanded and the amount supplied into balance. At that point, the price stabilizes. So if the price is too high, suppliers will have to lower the price in order to sell it. The lower price will encourage people to buy more, assuming it's something that people want. The price change works to bring the amount demanded by consumers into balance with the amount produced by suppliers. I have a graph that's going to show this in just a moment. So this is also true in politics. In most cases, voters are more likely to support political candidates and policies that provide them with net personal benefits. Uh, and the converse is true as well. This can be uh, beneficial. It can also be detrimental because politicians like to buy votes sometimes. This is a central idea from the class. There is no such thing as a free lunch. I can't stress this enough. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Someone always has to pay for lunch. See these animals looking at a trap set up and there's a predator over there behind the bush. And they say, that in my experience, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And indeed, that is true. Someone always has to pay for lunch. Now, what we mean by that, because we cannot have as much as everything we would like, we are forced to choose among alternatives. There is no free lunch. 
Doing one thing makes us sacrifice the opportunity to do something else we value. This is why we talk about opportunity cost. So we've already talked about that a bit. So Dr. Branch's next level. I've had many students over the years when I, when I was a Vice President for Student Development here and doing student recruiting had students who were not Southern Baptist but wanted to come to a Southern Baptist school because IMB missionaries don't raise their own support. And so their mind, this was free money to help them go to missions. What they did not understand is somebody's paying for the missionary and, and the International Mission Board, that payment is coming from either the Lottie Moon Christian uh, Christmas offering or from the cooperative program, all of which are funded by Southern Baptist. And they had this idea that uh, sometimes I think some of these young people thought money actually was growing on a tree at Richmond, Virginia. But furthermore, the people paying for these missionaries actually expect them to be Baptist. And that was a challenge. So I had students that came and they weren't really Baptist, but they simply wanted to be an IMB missionary. And they didn't understand that the full name is the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. And that they actually wanted Baptist missionaries. Governments, hey, listen, politicians often talk about free health care, free housing. Uh, right now there's all this talk, 2016, as I'm recording this, about free education. There's no such thing. None of these things are free. Uh, someone is paying for them. And you cannot pursue every good idea that comes along, which is what governments don't seem to understand at times. But when we talk about, for example, paying for everyone's college education so they have free college education, it's not free. The taxpayers are paying for it. It just means that the student doesn't pay any tuition when they register for the class. But somebody's paying for it. There is no free lunch. And economists are the ultimate party poopers. Someone has to remind caring, enthusiastic Christians that we simply cannot pursue every single good idea that comes along. That's true in the church, and that's true in your own life, and that's true in the government. Proverbs 8.10 says, Choose my instruction rather than silver, and knowledge rather than pure gold. That's talking about opportunity costs right there. So decisions are made at the margin in economics, and what that means is, suppose some children are selling some lemonade on a hot summer day, and they're selling it for a dollar a glass. Well, that first glass is worth a dollar to me because I am I am very thirsty and I'm parched and it's refreshing. The next glass doesn't give me the same quantity of refreshment, so it's not worth quite as much to me. So I'm going to think more about buying that next glass than I would the first glass. So if you think at the margin, you're thinking about what the next or additional action means to you. This is true in every level of life. So I'm going to skip past this section about trade promotes progress. I'm going to skip past transaction costs. I do want to point out to you, I've already talked about the law of supply and demand. This chart illustrates that. This is very common. This is basic economics. And all I'm pointing out to you is the idea is that when the price for a product is at a level where, where the producer makes a profit and he or she is happy and the consumer feels like the product is worth the price they're paying and they are happy, then the price has reached equilibrium. This is central to basic economics. So uh, let me say a few other things. Let me scoot on here. People earn income by helping others. This is a key idea from this book. They are, this book that you're reading is advocating free market capitalism. Now, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm not a socialist or a Marxist or a communist. But uh, I do have some pushback at some of their ideas. But one thing I think they get right is you actually earn money when you produce things that people need and make their lives better. And their argument is when you have a free market, it's going to make more things to make life better for more people. And I, I basically agree with that premise. So here it is. In a market economy, people who earn high incomes do so because they provide others with lots of things they value. If individuals, consumers, did not provide, excuse me, producers did not provide valuable goods or services, consumers would not pay, not pay for them so generously. There is a moral here. If you want to earn a high income, you beggar figure out how to help others a great deal. Bill Gates has become fabulously wealthy because he figured out how to help people processing information through uh, laptops and computers and the software to do all that. He's become fabulously wealthy but people are very happy, uh, or most of the time they're happy with their computers. But the point is they're, they're glad to pay for these things because it's made their life better. And so he wins, he's gotten wealthy, the consumer wins because now they feel like their life is better uh, with these. It's just amazing, the laptop computers we have now are, 
uh, would have been just a dream to the people putting men on the moon in the 1960s. Here's the point. Even people who don't care about improving the world, who are motivated mostly by the desire for income, will have a strong incentive to develop skills and take actions that are valuable for others. So there, your textbook authors are trying to argue that free markets have a redemptive quality to them to a certain degree. Now, what I'm going to argue is that free markets are not always redemptive. Uh, my a friend of mine, Matt Arbo, who used to teach here, and I, he and I have chatted about this a couple of times, and I don't think free markets are always redemptive, but I think they're the best option out there. So that's my argument. There's no The Bible doesn't give us a clear economic theory, but some form of free market capitalism is the closest with Scripture. So let me scoot on past a few other things. The invisible hand, this comes from Adam Smith. There'll be a question about this on the midterm. And basically what the invisible hand is, is the idea that self-interest, a producer is, wants to make a profit, plus competition, there's other people that want something, or they're producing something, and they need something. So all these things come together, self-interest plus competition equals the invisible hand. These drive things toward this uh, market equilibrium that we looked at er earlier. So is this consistent with Scripture? Is, is self-interest always good for society? Sometimes it's not. How does the doctrine of the sovereignty of God influence our analysis of these things? And how does the doctrine of human sinfulness influence our analysis? Do people always do things uh, for other people because they know they're good for them? For example, someone who produces pornography. Well, people want it. There's a market for it, but it's certainly not good for people. So I'm going to argue that free markets are not always redemptive, but they usually do work out better than any other option out there. So that's my, my big point, is that free market capitalism, or some form of it, is simply better than any other option. So these are a few of the key ideas that come out of Chapter 1. I hope this is helpful for you as uh, you look through the notes and get ready for the midterm as you learn more about economics.